You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Today on the Useless Information Retrocast, you'll hear 10 totally true Christmas stories that have been mostly forgotten to time. You'll learn about how the savings accounts of 41,000 Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania students were saved after their bank went bankrupt. And then there's the story of a man who was served golf ball hash for Christmas. And how about two boys who had a conversation via their new walkie-talkies with the one and only Santa Claus? Well, all those stories and more are coming up next. I am Steve Silverman, and this is the Useless Information Podcast. Useless Information. Hi, everyone. Happy holidays. Uh, today's kind of a bonus episode. I just put this together very quickly. And that's because I had a whole bunch, a whole pile of Christmas shorts, just little stories in my collection. So I decided to take 10 of them and put them into a short retro cast. Now, I'm just going to read these word for word, and I'm not going to add much in the way of comments, but I think you will enjoy it. So let's dive right in. The story is from the December 25th, 1915 edition of the New York Times. And there's four headlines to this. The main headline is, Frick pays deposits of 41,000 children. The first subheadline is, makes Christmas gift to pupils in closed Pittsburgh bank for savings. Beneath that, it says, offer involves $167,136. And the last subheadline is, collectors authorized by education board gathered pennies in schools weekly. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, December 24th. Joy prevailed in the hearts of Pittsburgh school children tonight, as a result of the announcement late today by Henry C. Frick that he would pay in full as a Christmas gift all the accounts of the 41,000 children depositors in the Pittsburgh Bank for Savings, which was closed here last Wednesday by order of the State Department of Banking. The deposits amount to $167,136.68, and payment will be made in cash about January 3rd. I did a quick check and adjusted for inflation. That would be about $4.6 million today. To induce children to save, a school savings fund was started many years ago. Through an agreement with the City Board of Education, bank collectors visited the 132 schools in the city weekly. Penny by penny, the deposits of the children increased. When Mr. Frick, who is in New York, was informed that thousands of children were depositors, he at once communicated with H.C. McEldeny, president of another local bank, and announced that he would take care of the fund in such a way that the school children would not lose a cent. The proposal was submitted to G.H. Getty, receiver for the closed institution, who got the approval of State Banking Commissioner W.H. Smith and Attorney General Frank S. Brown to assist in carrying out the plan. Mr. Frick specified the children would receive their money without delay, and arrangements were made with the officials of the Pittsburgh Bank for Savings and the Union Savings Bank to formulate a plan for the paying of the 41,000 accounts just as soon as the state banking officials can complete their canvas of the books of the closed institution. The manner of making payments will be announced through the principals of the schools. Mr. Frick, according to tentative plans, will pay the children the amount now on deposit, and when a liquidation has been effected, will collect their claims. Just what dividend the bank will pay each depositor has not been determined, but bank officials said it would amount to about 50%. This next story is from the October 30th, 1920 edition of the Santa Ana Register, and the headline reads, Christmas Cactus Theft Epidemic On. With an epidemic on for stealing Christmas cactus, Owners of such potted plants were advised by City Marshal Jernigan to take them in at night. A number of complaints have been made recently to the police department on the theft of cactus plants from porches. The most recent complaints are from Mrs. A.J. Welligmuth, 207 North Van Ness, and Mrs. J.E. Leibig, 820 Spurgeon. Officers have no clue and are at a loss to determine whether the thieving is by kids or by someone who is attempting to accumulate a number of plants. And this one's from the November 13th, 1947 publication of the Detroit Free Press. The headline reads, Locked In, Gift Wrapper Wraps in Vain. 
All alone and locked in eight floors up Wednesday night was Joe Gibson, 49, of 2332 Park, who had been so busy wrapping Christmas parcels for the J.L. Hudson Company, he didn't notice time pass. Unable to attract the watchman, he improvised a rope from rags, string, and electric wire, to which he attached a cardboard sign pleading for help. This he dangled from a warehouse window at 310 East Jefferson. After an hour, a passerby noticed the dancing SOS 10 feet above him. He called police. Release Gibson said he was through working overtime alone. This one's from the December 14, 1949 publication of the Akron Beacon Journal, and the headline reads, Bobby Gets Christmas Wish, Stone for His Mother's Grave. Montrezville, Pennsylvania Associated Press. 11-year-old Bobby Lavelle is going to get his Christmas wish, a tombstone for his mother's grave. Bobby's mother died in October 1948 and was buried in the Montresville Cemetery. Several days ago, the youngster, who lives in a trailer camp with his father, an unemployed laborer on relief, decided to find his mother's unmarked grave. His search proved successful yesterday after he enlisted the aid of Police Chief Stanley C. Zartman. Quote, Someday I'll have enough money to buy a marker for my mother's grave, Bobby told Zartman. The police chief related the story to a newspaper, and the J.E. Gibbons Company offered to donate a tombstone, engrave it, and have it in place by Christmas. Bobby examined the firm's stock, passed by a number of ornate stones, and selected a two-by-three-foot marker. Quote, I would like very much to have that one, he said. Now I can find Mother's grave and put flowers on it. Meanwhile, local merchants promised Bobby's Christmas would not be without gifts, including a permanent movie pass. And Zartman said he was making arrangements to find Bobby a new home, quote, under different environment. Now I did do a little checking, and Mom's name was Beatrice Lavelle, and she was born on September 3rd, 1900, and she died on October 5th of 1948, which of course made her 48 years of age. She died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Now I did check the website Find the Grave and there's no listing of her grave site. And this next one's also from the Akron Beacon Journal and it's from December 25th of 1949. The headline reads, Beggar Back in Disguise, Gift to Akronite Recalls Handout. A beggar who received a cup of coffee and two slices of buttered toast from Mrs. Marie Dowdy, 536 House Street, last September, must have been Santa Claus in disguise. He returned to the Doty home Saturday afternoon and repaid the gift a hundredfold. Mrs. Doty didn't recognize the well-dressed caller. Quote, You don't remember me, he said. You gave me a bite to eat when I needed it badly. Here's a Christmas gift. He placed a $5 bill in her hand and walked away. And while $5 may not seem like much today, actually $5 in 1949 would be close to $60 today. Next up, we have a story from the Los Angeles Times that was published on December 24th of 1952. The headline is, Mother of Four Gets Roof as Christmas Gift. Many people like many things for Christmas, and one of the oddest gifts of the day was given to the young mother of four who lives in an old house in southwest Los Angeles with her brood. The donors were members of the Embassy Club, a group of students from Washington High School, and the recipients were Mrs. Delia Hagen and her fatherless youngsters, Shirley Ann 14, Tom 12, Gail 7, and Johnny 5. Like the woman who lived in a shoe and had so many children she didn't know what to do, Mrs. Hagen, 33, wanted most of all for the family to have a new roof before the seasonal rains made a virtual pool of her home's interior. But on her modest living allotment from state aid, funds could not be stretched to include having the weather-battered and wind-blown roofing repaired or replaced. That's where the Embassy Club and some members of the South Los Angeles Optimist Club came into the picture. The Optimist sponsored the boys' club. Optimist Club Vice President Carly Boson made some arrangements and, with the cooperation of Ted Walters, manager of a roofing company, and the willing hands of six members of the Embassy Club, 
the new roof on the Hagen house went on in quick order. And here's a funny one from the December 27, 1955 publication of the Akron Beacon Journal. The headline is, Something to Ball About His Wife Teed Off. Bisco, North Carolina, Associated Press. Lou LeQuire, a textile worker who frequently loses track of time while he's playing golf, promised to return home Monday in time to take his family to a movie. He came in late as usual and sat down to a plate of warmed-over turkey hash. Dipping into it, he found three well-cooked golf balls, Christmas presents from his wife. We've all experienced lost packages and lost mail, and this story is no exception. It's from October 13, 1960, and it appeared in the Cincinnati Inquirer. The headline reads a bit slow, Yule Card's letters 20 years late. Detroit, October 12th, Associated Press. Christmas came early, or was it 20 years late for the Leo Wessinger family of suburban Highland Park? Greeting cards and letters from people no longer living arrived in the regular mail delivery this week. All were postmarked 1940. One of the cards was from Mrs. Wessinger's aunt, Mrs. Anna Zink of Alpena, Michigan. Mrs. Zink died 11 years ago. Another was from Wessinger's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Wessinger of Milford, Michigan. Joseph Wessinger died five years ago. A letter from one of Mrs. Wessinger's friends said she was going to stop teaching because she was expecting a baby. Quote, That baby Larry now is in the Marine Corps, Mrs. Wessinger said. The woman also inquired about Mrs. Wessinger's new baby girl, Martha, who 20 years later is employed as a secretary. Postal officials were unable to explain why the mail was detained. And here's one more from the Akron Beacon Journal. It was printed on December 20th of 1965. The headline is, Better Stick to Reindeer. Rathdrum, Ireland, Associated Press. A parachuting Santa Claus was blown into a 10,000-volt power line Sunday, but escaped with burns and a broken arm. There was a brilliant flash from the power line as Kenneth Conway's parachute became entangled in the wires. The 22-year-old Dubliner was knocked unconscious and flung 27 feet, or 8.2 meters, to the ground. And our last Christmas story for today was from the Times Standard and was printed on December 27th of 1972. The headline is Santa Claus Mystery in Idaho. Twin Falls, Idaho, United Press International. You can't tell Michael Van Osdown 8 and his brother Kurt 10 that Santa Claus doesn't exist. They know he checks up occasionally on the toys he leaves. Michael and Kurt were trying out the walkie-talkie set they got Christmas morning. Quote, I can't hear you, Michael said into the phone set. Can you hear this? Interrupted a friendly but unfamiliar voice. Yes, replied the startled 10-year-old. This is Santa Claus. How do you like your walkie-talkies? Fine, replied Kurt. Where do you live? Santa asked. In Twin Falls, Idaho, the boy answered. Merry Christmas to Twin Falls and to you, Santa said, ending the conversation. The boy's father, Robert Van Alsdon, who witnessed the conversation, said he doesn't know how the mystery voice was picked up, but the boys have no doubt now that there is a Santa. Quote, Last year the oldest wasn't quite sure, he said but they pretty well do this year. That cinched it. I hope you enjoyed those Christmas shorts. I had a whole pile of them, and I figured, well, if I didn't use them now, when would I use them? I have to wait till next year. But of course, by then, I'd have a whole bunch more. Anyway, just a reminder that my publisher currently has my latest book, The Flip Side of History, and it does have the subheading of Strange News, Hard to Believe Headlines, and Other Curious Stories from History. That book and every other one on their website is now 30% off through the end of January 2023. Should you wish to purchase a copy, just go to my website, that's uselessinformation.org, and on the right-hand side, you'll see a picture of the book. Click on that. It'll take you to the web page that has that book, and there's a link to the publisher's website. You have to purchase a book through the publisher directly to get that discount. If you prefer, just go to their website, go to mango.bz, that's mango.biz, and then do a search for The Flipside History, or my name's Steve Silverman, and it should pop up. 
Now, I'll be back probably about a week into the new year with a new story that I've been working on, and I think you're really going to enjoy that. In the meantime, I just want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, or whatever you celebrate, and probably most important, a happy and healthy new year. Uh, I hope that it's a good one for everyone. Now, I'm going to leave you with a Christmas song. This is recorded in 1913, and it's called On a Good Old Sleigh Ride, and it was recorded by the Peerless Quartet. I purposely put this at the end of the podcast because it's kind of scratchy and you may not want to listen to it. But if you'd like to hang around and listen to it, enjoy. Take care, everyone. Bye. Everybody's going on a ride. Hurry up, they hear them cry. All aboard, away we fly. Come on, here he for that old play ride. Come on, here he cuddles by my side. With bumps and bumps and yaks and bells. But the little boys shout out, everybody make a lot of noise. Look at the jingle, 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 hear the sleigh bells ring. Oh!